Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome uh, to ANRIC for the launch of the United Nations Secretary General's high level panel report on global sustainability. Resilient people, resilient planet, a future worth choosing. It's a real privilege and an honor for us uh, to have three actors, um, key actors, involved in the preparation of this report and of the Rio Plus 20 conference to be held um, in June in Brazil. European Commissioner for Climate Action, uh, Madame uh, Connie Hedegaard, who is a member of the high-level panel, Monsieur Brice Lalonde, Executive Coordinator of Rio Plus 20, and Mr. Janos Pastor, Executive Secretary of the high-level panel. We will hear from the three speakers and then open up the floor for um, Q&A. If I may, Mr. Pastor, I will begin with you. If you could tell us the, the who, why, and when of the, of the high-level panel. And then we will move on to Commissioner Hedegaard to speak uh, about the recommendations uh, of the report itself. And we will end with you, Mr. Lalonde, to tell us about the conference. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, um, I am, as was mentioned, I was the ex I'm, I'm the executive secretary of this high-level panel on global sustainability. This is actually a panel that the Secretary General set up in August uh, 2010. Uh, so uh, we had about 18 months of work behind us, and the reason why he set this up is because he was, as he still is, very much concerned about climate change. Uh, but increasingly, uh, he realized that uh, you cannot resolve climate change simply in the climate change bubble that it is now being considered, that one has to look at climate change in the broader context of sustainable development. And so he set up this panel to try to address these issues and to try to advise him on, on that. So he set up this high-level panel, and the uh, basic... Uh, uh, Requ not requirement, the request was that the panel members be bold, uh, come up with recommendations that are out of the box, but at the same time uh, come up with recommendations that are feasible, that are indeed doable. So he set up the panel with the two co-chairs. Uh, the co-chair, uh, one of them was President Tari Halonen of Finland, and the other one was President Jacob Zuma of South Africa. And 20 members uh, uh, were there, and they all represent high-level political personalities who have experience uh, on these issues, but at the same time uh, who are uh, involved with day-to-day decision-making because of their positions. And that was key for the Secretary General because he wanted to have that political feasibility in the recommendations. And that is why he went for this kind of a high-level uh, panel. And one member is sitting uh, uh, here on the podium, uh, Commissioner uh, Hedegaard. Um, there was also one member from the private sector and one from civil society, um, uh, but the members all uh, were requested to act in their personal capacities, and uh, I think they did that. Now, uh, the um, uh, process, uh, we've had uh, six meetings of the panel over the last 18 months. We had very many Sherpa meetings, and I believe there is at least one Sherpa in the room, Michael, <laughs> uh, who have done a lot of work between the, the panel meetings. There were lots of consultations with uh, uh, civil society, with uh, the private sector, uh, with UN organizations, and also with governments. Uh, we engaged a number of experts to help our work. There were working groups, and there were indeed many sleepless nights, uh, I'm sure. Uh, from the panel members and their advisors as much as from the secretariat. But nevertheless, uh, after 18 months of work, we managed to uh, get the report done. The report, and you've seen, I think, many of you, the summary booklet, uh, uh, the, the full report is available on the website uh, uh, of the United Nations, un.org slash GSP. Uh, this report was formally launched last week in Addis Ababa on the 30th of January when uh, President uh, Jacob Zuma handed over the report to the Secretary General uh, on the side of the AU summit in Addis Ababa. And now, after that uh, formal launch, we are in the process of doing a number of regional launches, uh, 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 including uh, one in Geneva this morning, uh, and one in Copenhagen this morning, and now one here in 
Brussels. Uh, and there will be many others uh, to come uh, in the couple of, next couple of weeks. Uh, just very briefly, and then I, I will stop talking, uh, uh, this report is not the end of the work uh, that we have. This is the end of the preparation of the report, but the real hard work is beginning now. Uh, because the recommendations, 56 of them, they will have to be implemented. And if we just simply put the report on our bookshelves, then we know exactly what is going to happen. It's going to gather dust and nothing will happen. So we, we and that means the Secretary General, that means panel members, uh, that means uh, uh, other colleagues in the system, we're working very hard now to make sure that the message gets out, that it creates debate uh, and, and eventually action and implementation. Uh, many of the recommendations are directed to the Secretary General, specifically Secretary General of the United Nations, and he will follow up on them, including uh, uh, a number of uh, very interesting areas like uh, uh, setting up a task force on sustainable development indicators uh, and coming up with a, uh, a report on that very quickly by 2014, uh, then setting up an expert mechanism to help develop sustainable development goals, uh, and also, very interestingly, to bring together a report, an annual, or not annual, regular global outlook report on sustainable development. Because we have many reports on health, on environment, on economic issues, but we don't have one that looks at the totality. The key in, this, uh, in the request to the Secretary General is not to do it himself or the United Nations as such, but to use his convening power to engage different actors from civil society, from the private sector, from the UN entities, and also other intergovernmental organizations to get the job done. So this is, this is quite important. And the Secretary General will be very in, uh, seriously looking at the details of these recommendations and will follow them up. And one final word, uh, the Secretary General has also been asked by the panel to uh, help in the overall reaching out and the overall implementation of these recommendations, and he will um, engage very seriously with member states. Uh, the first thing he'll do next week is to send this report formally to heads of state and government, and with a, with a cover note to encourage implementation and encourage further debate and discussion, particularly in view of the upcoming Rio Plus 20 conference, but that's not the only place where we hope there will be follow-up discussions. There is the G20, there is the World Economic Forum, and there are many, many other places where uh, relevant recommendations can be discussed and implemented. Thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner. Thank you very much. One would, of course, understand if people thought, well, that's just <laughs> yet another report, and they would be sort of receiving it nicely, and then it would go to the shelf with all the other reports. I understand when you sit with all these 100 pages and say that's a lot of words, how, how do I really sort of uh, cope with this? How can this change anything? One recommendation for how to read this could be simply to try to read through in this uh, sort of summary, read through all the recommendations. And if you take the recommendations <coughs> and read through but from one to 56, there are 56 all in all. I think that it's fair to say that what is here is a call for a paradigm shift. A paradigm shift in the way we have our growth, the way we talk about our growth, the way we measure our growth, so that we will move into a direction of a smarter, a greener kind of growth. And therefore, the first point we make very clear in sort of the introductory <coughs> chapter of this report that is that business as usual is simply not an option. Uh, and we give some facts for that, but we also give some economic facts for that. Why that if we just sort of make the forecast on all sorts of parameters with the fact that we are still more people on planet Earth, planet Earth a very steeply increase in how many of the citizens of the Earth that will join the middle classes and how many commodities and goods uh, they will ask for in years to come. There we try to make a very clear case showing why business as usual is not an option, not for the climate, not for the environment, not for social cohesion, but also not economically speaking, because the consequences of just continuing business as usual would be very, very big. So I think this is the first part where we have to change the way we think. Normally, if you ask in finance ministries, for instance, 
they would tend to believe that if just you make sort of the budget next year like you did that this year or last year, then, then it, it costs nothing more. And that is really going to be a big lie because the consequences of continuing business as usual will be very big. And if you start to realize that, then of course, the next thing is, instead of paying for the consequences, the cost of business as usual, why not invest in a smarter kind of future? We were asked by the Secretary General to sort of take into special consideration sort of the nexus between water, food, and energy with climate change as sort of an overarching challenge. And just to give you a few of the figures that you will find in this report, what we know is that 18 years from now, I mean, it's not an eternity, 18 years from now, the global demand after food are expected to increase by at least 50%. The global demand after energy is expected to increase by at least 45%, and the global demand after water is expected to increase by at least 30%. That is the kind of challenges we are in for. So what do we then suggest in these recommendations? I'll not walk through all of them, but just saying sort of a, a few things. One of the recommendations that is, we should have a stronger link between politics and science. Why that recommendation? Because we could see when we started to discuss, for instance, planetary boundaries or what is happening to the seas, uh, challenges like that, then it became very clear that the world does not, in all of these fields, have sort of an overview of available science. So we say that there must be, in order for us to take more sound decisions for the future, there must be a clearer link between science and politics. Uh, and what uh, Janos Pastor just mentioned about having sort of a thematic uh, sustainability, both a council but also an annual or biannual report, that, of course, could also be something where you ask science then to say, if we have a theme called the blue oceans for the next two years, for instance, how can we then take care that we also have the overview of the science that we need? So this is one recommendation. We have a lot of recommendations showing why this is also about social cohesiveness. This is also about women's rights. It's also about um, education. There are many of these kind of crucial traditional development uh, issues where we still are not having a adequate, sustainable kind of uh, development globally, and that's why there are really many of these kind of recommendations. But I would say that one of the key recommendations you will find in recommendation number 27. And if you look at that, you will see it's, it's a rather sort of substantial and long one, because that is basically our recommendations for a sustainable economy. And what we try to, the, the case that we are making there in, in, in the, the different paragraphs leading up to it, but also in the recommendations itself, that is that we say we must find a very different way of pricing the common goods. Pricing environment, pricing pollution, make it more, if you want this transition to happen, there must be a cost tag uh, attached to polluting, depleting resources, depleting water resources, uh, polluting air or whatever it is. So this is a key recommendation where we also say that we should have it as part of, for instance, natural budgets when you're making the annual budgets, that it's not just the traditional GDP uh, way of measuring things, mm -hmm that you also go beyond the GDP and that you also measure sustainability. So it's a broader way of talking growth than just the traditional materialistic economic kind of growth. There must be the other factors must be counted in as well. And of course, when you want this, then it is logical that there will also be a rather strong recommendation that we must phase out uh, environmental harmful subsidies, but a very specific one also on phasing out uh, subsidies for fossil fuels. The fact is that in 2010, the last year where we have the figures from, the world 
subsidize fossil fuels with more than 400 billion US dollars, whereas we were only subsidizing renewables for 60 some billion US dollars. In other words, we subsidize fossil fuels six to seven times as much as renewables. If you want a paradigm shift, then this was a place to start. So this is also a, a key recommendation. And then we also advocate that we should, and preferably already in, uh, in Rio this June, where we have Rio Plus 20, we should adopt the target of access to sustainable energy for all. This is not just a question of what would make sense for climate or environment. It is also on the basis that we think you cannot in the 21st century have development in, say, rural areas of, of India or Africa, wherever, if you do not give people access to energy. But it is uh, no secret that uh, we had some debate about this access to sustainable energy. And uh, I'm very glad that this is a recommendation. It's access to sustainable energy. It's not just to have the cheapest kind of, of coal. We must try to get it more right in the areas where they are developing and uh, expanding in the energy field. So access to sustainable energy, a doubling of renewables, and a doubling of energy efficiency by 2030. That is also a key recommendation. Um, we, of course, also uh, tried to address the governance thing. Janos Pasta already mentioned some of the things, also how you, we can include people more. I mean, one of the big challenges we have in the world of the 21st century is that the economy has globalized, markets have gl globalized, as we have seen, banks definitely have globalized, but the political institutions uh, have very, very tough challenges in following suit to, to how the economy globalizes. Uh, so we advocate stronger institutions, for instance, in this, uh, a stronger U uh, United Nations environment uh, program, uh, but also ask the Secretary General to try to come up with this, having a more focused uh, discussion on what is really sustainable development in the world. Uh, that is also a recommendation. Um, as I said, I will not go through all these more detailed things, but how can we then avoid that a work like this just to end up on the shelf? Well, the first test could be Rio plus 20. And uh, there I look at Brice Lalonde, who's responsible for that, not alone, but he has a responsibility for this also. Because how could we persuade people that we really need a paradigm shift? The business as usual is not possible, is not responsible if then we have a major conference with thousands of participants taking stock of where we are on sustainability 20 years after Rio, if we did not manage to at least translate some of these recommendations into some specific uh, decisions in Rio. So I would very much hope that we are not giving up already on Rio, say, oh, it's about everything and nothing, and that can really not uh, deliver a lot. I believe that if the world really wants, then four and a half months, we, in four and a half months, we can actually take some new substantial steps forward. And just to, to wrap up, I would hope that this pricing discussion uh, would be in, in, in the focus uh, up to Rio and in Rio. I would very much hope that in Rio we could have this access to sustainable energy by, for, for all by 2030, that that could be a decision because we are recommending it here. Others have been developing how this could be done. And there is a very specific group of energy experts right now saying not just whether you could do it, but exactly how you could do it. So there is a lot of preparatory work being done there. And final point to Rio Plus 20, that's also one of our recommendations. We recommend that while we have the Millennium Development Goals, and they have definitely served their purpose, uh, we should try to sort of also come up with sustainable development goals. We know that it might be difficult for the world community to define exactly what they should be in Rio. I also know that some think that that, that should be doable, but at least we say we could have a set of sustainable development goals defined by no later than 2014. Uh, and thereby, if Rio Plus 20 decided to go in this direction, 
that could also be a key deliverable coming out of uh, Rio where people could see that we actually managed to take some decisions in Rio that lead to rather immediate action. So that is the hope that this resilient people, resilient planet, a uh, future was choosing, that that could really inspire to some rather tangible results coming out of, of Rio. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Monsieur Lalonde, so how smooth has the road to Rio been so far? Well, thank you. In 1992, um, uh, Rio, there was a report which was very important a few years before, which was Mrs. Brundtland's report, which coined the, th the term, you know, sustainable development. So this report has a new term, which is fairly difficult to translate in all languages, resiliency. So perhaps, I mean, um, I, can be, I can tell you that already 193 missions in New York are reading this very, very carefully. And what's very encouraging, and I hope this report will have the same impact as Bruntland's report had in 92, is that we already have a zero draft in our negotiations. I mean, the first draft, which is going to be the basis of our negotiations, has been written, it has been issued. And quite a lot of things are already in the zero draft, which are in the recommendations. So this is something which is encouraging. For instance, um, already in the zero draft, 193 countries, if it's carried on to the end in Rio, have, are asking the Secretary General to come with a report on new indicators, are asking for the Secretary General to try to convene a group which would um, uh, help us um, come out with um, mil um, sustainable development goals to be merged or to complement millennium development goals after the review in, 19, in 213 and 15. I mean, so all this is already, um, uh, you know, thought about. People are, are, are working on that. The report is also very important, in my view, to help the, 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 the negotiators in Rio because it's been written and, and sponsored by head of states. While for the time being, the head of states are welcome, are invited to Rio, are going to come in Rio. But for the time being, it's only negotiators. So negotiators are usually inclined to, to read very carefully what head of states have decided. It is also um, insisting on two very important issues which are politically completely different from 92. Well, one is um, uh, insisting on uh, the weight of population in very poor countries, and the other is on the lifestyles of the, of the rich countries. And for the first time, perhaps, in Rio, we're going to have goals not only for the poorest, how can we lift them out of poverty, but also some goals for the richest, how can they reduce their environmental footprint on the planet? Because we cannot afford to have 7 billion people really living on the, same, on the same luxury, I would say, path. So this report is already showing this, is already shaping this, and it's for the first time, you know, it's probably showing a sort of a big curb in our international politics. It's also very... It's insisting very much on empowerment, and empowerment, especially of women also, is, is a theme which is probably going to be more and more important in our negotiations. How can we help people to participate? And for instance, um, one recommendation is asking for the governance system of the United Nations and all governance system to include the civil society, business, and not only to have intergovernmental negotiations. So the governments should give place more and more to civil society, to other actors, to build partnerships. This is also shaping in our EU negotiations. So overall, I think um, uh, this report is very important. It's coming at the right time. I think for the negotiators now, it is how are we going to I would say concentrate these 56 recommendations in a few core priority resolutions and decisions to be taken in Rio. Rio, as you know, Rio plus 20 does not mean 20 years after Rio 92. It means, and from now on, in the next 20 years, from now on to 2032, what must we do all together? Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you for clarifying that last bit, because uh, we were, most of us, thinking it was 20 years after Rio. Thank you. Um, let's open up to questions. Please. Uh, could you introduce yourself? The microphone is in the handle in, the, in your armrest. Yes, thank you very much for this presentation and your remarkable work towards that great conference. My name is Daniel Schaubacher. I am uh, also a representative of the World uh, Federalist Movement. The European Union has overcome the, 
the, the problems created by this fetishism of total attachment to national sovereignty through the community approach. And it started with the community of coal and steel years ago. Now we have the Lisbon Treaty. The UN is doing an admirable work, but it's an intergovernmental approach. So is it not time for the EU, the parliament representing civil society? Civil society is globally organized. It has adopted a federal approach. The private sector is globally organized. It's federally uh, organized. Science has also a global approach. So is it not time for the parliament, the council, the commission, the Bureau of uh, European uh, Expert uh, Advisors to Mr. Barroso to come up with an incremental approach towards delegating this part of sovereignty, which has to do with food. You mentioned uh, the food issue. Water, climate eventually. We could start with a number of nations which want to embark on this experience, which uniquely the European Union has done, unlike the United Nations. International law today comes from the Security Council, which represents a situation of 1944. So I, I think it's very important that the EU in Rio starts thinking about this community, federal, global governance approach towards a target which is not politically sensitive, maybe food or water or climate. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a couple of questions and then uh, in the back there. Um, Stephen Gardner, Bloomberg, BNA, specifically on the renewable, sorry, the sustainable energy recommendation. Uh, should we take it that the consequence of that is the phase out of unsustainable energy by 2030? Is that what you're recommending? So, in other words, a okay. One more question. Yes, please. Uh, Thank you. Would you like to start? I can do that. To the last one, um, as we have done in the European Union, we have sustainability criteria for, for um, uh, biofuels. So I think that it's important to sort of acknowledge that there are some good biofuels and there are bad biofuels. But I basically agree with you that when we're also talking about food and food shortages and increased food prices, it's extremely important that everyone gets it right about biofuels. And my personal view is that, and has always been, we should be extremely careful what we do there. And we should also in Europe be careful now not to create industries that are sort of living from producing not so sustainable biofuels. And that is, of course, why we also have this discussion, for instance, of, of indire indirect land use change. And I think that this is important that we get it right in Europe, but I think that that is also a relevant topic uh, globally. And if I could sort of add to what this gentleman said about sort of um, using the community approach globally, some would argue that right now we are busy in Europe just getting the community approach right in, in Europe. <laughs> but, but okay, I think that basically, uh, we, the, the European position towards UN has always been that we want, we, we, we do not shy away from global targets, 
for setting up, whether it's Millennium Development Goals or new Sustainable Development Goals or targets for renewables, things like that. So I think that Europe would never be sort of blocking for these things, but I can assure you that we are really far from that sort of rosy scenario that the whole world just say that let UN have a bit more influence and take care of everything. Uh, so so f just to have this access to sustainable energy for all, to adopt such a target and uh, to agree to phase out subsidi uh, subsidies for fossil fuels, that would be a big progress uh, in the way that UN could have an, an interesting say. But I mean, when some of us are still working for a global climate deal and now are building all the nitty gritty sort of small bits and pieces together, that is exactly because we think that in more and more areas, we should have a global regime. In a globalized economy, we should have a globalized strong, globalized strong political instruments. Um, and then la very briefly to the, the second question, whether I, we saw, then also would say that we should phase out unsustainable energy by 2030. And the answer to that is no. And why is that? Because we will have, and that's the problem with energy politics, that when you build a new power plant, say a coal-generated power plant, it is there for the next 30, 40, 50 years, and we cannot uh, come to an area where they have unsustainable uh, fossil fuels, but now they finally got energy, and then to say that should be phased out by 2030. I'm sorry to say, but that would be totally theoretical. It would have no chance of, of flying. But that's why we should start now with the new building plans and say we should have aim for a sustainable energy for all. And the moment we decide that and getting the pricing signals right, then I'm sure that capital and investments would also go into a much more sustainable energy policy globally. Janusz, would you like to? Yeah, <coughs> just very briefly uh, to the gentleman's point about uh, sovereignty and the UN. Uh, the, the UN is, of course, an intergovernmental organization, no doubt. But the UN has a very long history of, of working with many other partners. And uh, what was interesting in the work of this panel and the recommendations of this panel, that they recognized that the Secretary General in particular has, has this amazing ability to convene actors that are beyond the government. And a perfect example is what Commissioner Hedegaard mentioned about the sustainable energy for all. This has been an initiative where the Secretary General was able to bring together the private sector, the civil society organizations, interested governments, and financiers together to, to, to make it happen, to actually not just think about a nice target, but say, how can we actually implement it? So these are the kinds of things that a UN Secretary General can do beyond the simple intergovernmental structures, and that's the idea. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Please. 
Uh, Chris Annenbilke, Head of um, UNEP Liaison Office to the EU. Uh, thank you to the Commission. Here I am. Thank you to the Commissioner for her forceful messages that we will surely carry forward. Um, a question on some of the recommendations. On some parts, the uh, recommendations are very strong, very forceful. For instance, um, I very much also appreciated paragraph 42 on the fact that sustainable development should be a, uh, an issue for the heads of governments. And in the same vein, paragraph 56, which calls upon the UNSG to better use the opening week of the GA for these issues. On some other aspects, the uh, recommendations are surprisingly prudent. Some might say weak. Um, three examples, 14. Equity is present in so many of the contributions that were sent to UNDESA. And so uh, 14 is extremely prudent in this, in this matter, as everyone can read. Second example, many contributions of governments and organizations and, of course, non-governmental stakeholders hint to the uh, possibil possibility of thinking about a global convention on CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. 29 doesn't go beyond anything but voluntary call to private sector. And the other one is Aarhus, uh, paragraph 40 leaves it entirely to the national governments, whereas even if you wouldn't ask for a global convention, you might, for instance, or some contributions have suggested regional, continental kind of Aarhus-like conventions. Can you lift a bit of the veil uh, of this work of the panel to, to help us to understand that? Thank you. Please. Gentleman in front. <coughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Vittorio Prodi, MEP. Um, Thank you, Commissioner, for being here. And, <clears throat> well, what I think is now um, uh, really distinguishing uh, the time we are living in is, uh, I would say, interdependence. We are all interdependent. And, uh, of course, uh, this uh, has to change the concept of, of sovereignty in the sense that uh, um, uh, no one, no country can think of being uh, sovereign as we were uh, used in past centuries to think. And so this is uh, uh, the, the challenge is to uh, uh, learn how to manage consensually interdependence. And that of course is uh, uh, again uh, going beyond the GDP and uh, of course we have uh, to understand that uh, we have to give uh, uh, factuals uh, uh, suggestions uh, beyond in beyond GDP, and one of the things that I consider uh, extremely important would be uh, uh, to ensure a fair access to natural resources that are limited, and the, we have to learn how to use them consensually. And of course, the, the, the second concept could be uh, uh, the common good as a specification of beyond GDP, because that could allow us to dematerialize some of our consumptions and, of course, make uh, 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 our uh, world more sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to start? Commissioner, did the report go far enough? No, definitely not. Uh, of course not. I mean, it is 22 um, persons in their own capacity who w was on that panel. <coughs> and uh, at such a panel, you have the choice. Do you want to end up with everybody having their own sort of minority paragraph here and there and everywhere? And what is then the impact of the panel afterwards? Or do you try to seek sort of a, a common denominator? And then, of course, some recommendations are, are stronger than others. Let me also say that there is another very, very practical reason. I mean, it's not so that Janos have had 100 different uh, analysts sitting in New York to do this. Uh, and this was not, you know, Brundtland, uh, the Brundtland Commission, when they were sitting, they had more than three years. Uh, we have had 16 months from, from the very first meeting to the very last meeting where we had to sort of have all the recommendations there. And that is simply just there is a limit as to how much can you simply 
do it with the secretariat of a, of a handful of people. Uh, so, so yes, some recommendations are, are stronger and more elaborate than others. You could also claim that the whole governance thing could have been even stronger. That's a big, big issue in itself, the whole UN governance and what to do and what kind of model to find. And we have come with some recommendations, but of course you could have gone into more details there. So Tony Long, just this on the, yes, it's difficult with the pricing. No doubt about it. I just think that where this might have been sort of, sort of a, a debate on the fringe, it's moving more and more into the center of economists discussion. When I went to Davos two weeks ago, CEOs now are saying, we need another way of measuring what growth is. We need some other pricing incentives because we want to do the right thing, but right now uh, the, the economy does not give us the incentives that are strong enough to do it. Uh, please do something about this. So I, I just say, hear what we're saying is, let's decide that we want to move beyond GDP and then uh, let's ask some people, set down a group or whatever, where of, of specialists who then sort of propose exactly how could that be done, but get a process started on this. So that's what we have suggested. And this asymmetry that you're mentioning, we also have recommendations that it should be very clear to uh, big companies that they must also account for their sustainability. And, and we make that sort of a recommendation that they should do it, including, by the way, also pension funds and, and, and investors, their recommendations on, on that as well. And uh, that th these issues about equity and other things that are not strong enough, that's clear. There are different views on this in the world. There were also different views. Of course, there would be, look, look who said in that, this panel, we could not come up with sort of the golden formula for how to sort of tackle equity. But on the other hand, we still take care that this issue is there. And I'm in no doubt that it will be a key issue in Rio Plus 20. It's also going to be a key issue, for instance, in the international climate uh, negotiations uh, very soon. Very final point to Prodi, Mr. Prodi. Yes, I, I actually forgot to say that in the beginning. I think that one of the key sort of messages here is also that we must leave or elaborate on the old north-south paradigm. That has in many ways served us well, but in the 21st century we must sort of move beyond that. And, and, and this concept of being interdependent, that is extremely important in order to uh, handle our global challenges. And I believe that in that sense, Durban, the climate conference in Durban was interesting because there when Europe and least developed countries and the OSIS countries and a lot of, of developing and developed countries sort of got together and even the, the least developed countries of this world said, we are willing also to commit. Of course, they should not commit the same, but we are willing to commit in the same form, in the equally binding way as the developed countries that is where something interesting happened uh, via v multilateralism in the 21st century. And, and I believe that this should also be a priority issue for Rio Plus 20 to take that step forward, not to make this a very big con controversy, but actually just state the fact we are mutually interdependent. What you do has an impact on me and vice versa, and therefore we must be mutually accountable. Monsieur Lalonde, voulez uh, réagir? Ah, j'ai le droit de parler en français. Ah, bien sûr. Et vous pouvez poser des questions en français, bien évidemment. I think, bah, écoutez, je peux parler en français. Je, but I mean, I suppose most of you speak better English than French. Both, so I'll speak I'll, both. Okay. I think um, one of the problems we're going to face is that in Rio we're going to get to the day-to-day -day politics, tough politics, people having elections, people being in the short term. So, for instance, um, uh, pricing. Nigeria has just tried to suppress subsidies on, the fossil, on, on, on oil, actually, and this, it has to face riots. Probably they did it in a very clumsy way from, from you know, one day to another day, suppression, instead of doing it gradually. So why do you have riots? Because, of course, the prices of the food in the markets increase immediately. And so, of course, lots of um, uh, people, head of states, uh, would say um, uh, to, to suppress subsidies, but how am I going to do it? Because everything is going to be more expensive. So, um, as all these conferences have two major um, um, aims, one is to try to combat poverty, the other one is trying to stay in the, to the boundaries of the planet. 
if everything becomes more, more expensive suddenly, perhaps you're going to save the planet, but you're not going to lift people out of poverty. So you have to find a way immediately when you do that to find a way to, to get into the equity problem, which you were asking for. You have to have a rebate to the poor, and you have to find who's going to pay for that rebate. So, I mean, these discussions are going to happen in Rio in one way or another. The financial transaction tax is on the table, is on the zero draft, as also is the proposal of the Secretary General of the United Nations for, for sustainable energy for all. Let's take, um, for instance, um, the idea of having science and politics to talk together. Immediately, I can, I can give you the name of a country where people are actually campaigning right now who don't believe in science. Ah, so if now the, you can get science closer to politics, but politicians say they don't believe in science, what do you do? And so you get into the, you know, the fact of financing, financing electoral campaigns by um, lobbies and by industrial groups has no limit. You can put as much money as you want. Ah, there is a problem, democratic problem. Are we going to, probably not. It's going to be difficult to talk about that one. And uh, look, talk about um, uh, GDP. How long has it been that all of us, I mean, all this community and, and Commission Erdogan, we've been talking about that for ages. So I would, I would urge the, um, the Commission, actually, to make a proposal for the European Union countries, because it's never going to happen unless some countries show, show the way, show the example. Otherwise, for head of states, it's an academic discussion and they'll get lost of it because each has its preferred indicators, its preferred data, etc. Et we'll never, we're never going to move if we don't have a group of countries to show the way to do it. And it's not so easy. Why isn't it so easy? There was a beautiful job given by the World Bank a few years ago, a guy called Hamilton and his team. And it was called um, uh, The New Wealth of Nations. Fantastic. A little clin d'oeil, Adam Smith. And they were accounting for natural capital. And they showed that some countries actually so happy to show an increase in GDP are actually decreasing in growth. D decreasing because they are eating the natural capital. But they don't know it and they don't want to account for it. How are you going to say, hey, <coughs> Mr. Head of State of this country, you are actually decreasing, not increasing? How can you say that politically? And how can you say that in the, le classement des nations, some countries which figure they are at the head are going to be much received? I mean, it's, it's politically very sensitive. So, you know, we face all these day-to-day -day problems, but we have, to, we have to move, I agree. I mean, we have to fight. Rio Plus 20 is going to be fighting. I agree with you, monsieur. I think global commons, it's time to have a quantum leap in the United Nations. Some things are supranational. Yes, they are. Of course, it's more complicated because common goods, it's a bit political. What's common goods? Some countries, for instance, say water. The water is mine, it's not yours. I'm, I have the lack of my country. I have a lot of water. I'm going to sell it, but I'm not going to give it. It's mine, etc. So, you know, there's lots of things to do. And the truth is empowerment. That's in the report. Empowerment. We need you. We need people to push the governments. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. Voilà. <laughs> Uh, Janusz, would you, would well, you like to? I, after this, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, but <laughs> I, I will try anyway. <laughs> Brice, uh, but uh, one more word on the pricing issue, and, and it, it relates actually to a, uh, something bigger in the, the work of the panel, that there is not a single solution to any of these problems. It's, it's, one has to address a number of issues, whether it's all the 56 uh, recommendations or maybe some other things that are not in the report, but the point is that there is no single silver bullet. And pricing, as important as it is, on its own, it's difficult. We know that. But if, if, if pricing is looked at in the context of a political uh, approach to start measuring uh, progress in a different way, if at the same time you're looking at an index of sustainability, and if you're, if you're doing all these things together, then maybe the pricing also becomes a little <laughs> bit easier. And so that's, that's the, the concept of the panel, that you have to address the broader issues and a number of different actions together. Thank you. Can I just very briefly say, uh, I think that with this, um, how to make the budgets, one place to start is simply to have some sustainability indicators in addition to when you make your traditional budget. I mean, that is not rocket science, and that will then you will have the transparency, and if people are eating their future capital, they will at least be aware of that, and that would also give some hooks for civil society actually to, to engage in this. So, I mean, it does not have to be all that complicated to get started with some of these things. I agree with what Wes Lalonde said on how difficult it is with phasing out of fossil fuel subsidies. We all know that Prime Minister Goodluck Johnson in Nigeria fought a very, very tough and courageous battle as I see it. But we should just not 
that it is difficult, we should just take care that that does not get an excuse not to talk about it, because the fact is that only 10% of all these fossil fuel subsidies reach the poorest populations, only 10%. So that is why what we are suggesting, and we actually had a representative from Nigeria also on the panel, and we were discussing this also in the light of what happens in, in Nigeria, is face out the most harmful ones first. Do it gradually up to 2020, and then find out how to sort of find uh, other ways of compensating the poorest populations in the poorest countries. So it's not that we sort of say this is just a piece of cake, it's very easy, but we think there are ways to do this and we should not forget that 90% of the fossil fuel subsidies, they do not go to poor people. Yes, in the back. No, yeah, you. Yes. We'll take uh, three more questions. Thank you. Denise O'Claire from SIDSE, which is a coalition of um, European and North American Catholic development NGOs. Um, I'm interested um, in the, the choice of the terms that you used. I, I think I understand that you've chosen to use sustainable economy, whereas um, in the Rio Plus 20 conference, the, the main uh, reference is uh, green economy. And um, I was last week in, in Porto Alegre, Brazil, in the, the World Social Forum that was focused on the run-up to Rio Plus 20. And I would say that in civil society, let's say there's a, a critique of the green economy that's at best insufficient because it um, places more of an economic lens on environmental considerations um, and that there's, it doesn't address the, the rebalance that's needed between economic, um, societal, and, and environmental considerations. And I think at worst, then, there's a, a, the opinion that green economy is, is a harmful concept because it doesn't address the, um, doesn't change fundamentally the destructive drivers of unsustainable resource use, like imbalances between rich and poor actors, private and public actors. So I was wondering if you could comment on how you see sustainable economy as a concept that goes beyond green economy. Thank you. Uh. Uh, Michel Lavollet, founder of Public-Private Partnerships Europe. I have two questions. One related to breaking down the silos. You mention water, you mention food, you mention energy. Why don't you mention health, for instance? It's not a commodity, but it's a, it's a, it's a common good, particularly in the context of what you're going to try to do with MDGs, trying to uh, merge your agenda with the MDG agenda and beyond 2015. So that's a question. And maybe we could add that there are good models in, in health in the last 10 years. Second question is about the, what Brice mentioned uh, about partnership, the role of partnerships with the private sector. Do you have an aggressive agenda on uh, developing uh, public-private partnerships to achieve your ambitions? Or uh, are you staying on uh, CSR themes or traditional themes of what can be negotiated uh, in Davos? while people are meeting in uh, Porto Alegre talking about totally different things. Uh, there's certainly a lot of opportunity that we've seen develop in uh, creating common goals and working together private NGOs and public to achieve common goals. Thank you. One more? Yes, you've been waiting a long time. My name is Shari. I'm a, um, world citizen and an international law researcher. Um, Monsieur Lalonde's um, uh, talk just a minute ago uh, sort of inspired me and gave me the courage to ask this question. That, uh, but before asking the question, uh, your four, number 47 recommendation mentions that uh, as international sustainable development policy is fragmented, and in particular, the environmental pillar is weak, UNP, UNEP should be strengthened. Now, uh, I'm asking sincerely, when you folks in the panel and trying to come up with a global solution for a global uh, problem, uh, do you see really a global institution capable of handling 
the sustainable development. And uh, without strengthening the UN, the parent organization of UNEP, where uh, the charter has never been reviewed in the past uh, since its uh, inception, uh, that uh, do we, is in a time to really to strengthen the parent company the, in terms of the, its democratization so it would be able to deal with this type of global issues. Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to start? Well, the report, there is the report and there is the open <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, 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 have a, I'll have a go at, at one song. Maybe I'll start with the last one. Uh, it's um, sustainable development is, at least from the point of view of this panel, is not equivalent to the environment. It's bigger than that. And there was a very big discussion about this. Uh, that sustainable development is really the totality of what is simplified into the three pillars. But in fact, life is a lot more complicated than the three pillars. But it's, it's, the concept is that it's about the totality. And, uh, for, and we don't have the international architecture at the, at the global level to respond to this complexity. We have a number of silo institutions in silos, whether it's environment, health, uh, food and agriculture, we have them all but we don't have the capacity to bring them together. So one point I wanted to say is that the recommendation of this panel on the, uh, in relation to the Sustainable Development Council at the global level, the idea is not just to create an institution. There may be an institution, but the more important idea behind it is to bring the different actors together because there is no single institution anywhere that can do the totality of sustainable development. There are lots of different institutions that can contribute to it, but there is no single institution. So what, the, what is being asked here is a, 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 an entity, an institution that does bring the different actors together. Now of those institutions, one of them is the environment program of the United Nations. And it is recognized by the panel that that institution is weak and that the overall policy on environment is weak and it needs to be strengthened. So it, it has to be strengthened as part of that totality. But the, the, the bigger picture is something that uh, is not just a new organization. It's something much, much more than that. And I think it will take some time, even if it, governments can move quickly on it, it will take some time to really make it work on the concept of bringing different actors together. And uh, I think I'll leave it. Commissioner? Very briefly, this why, why sustainable uh, economy instead of green economy, we have both. We also have green economy in, uh, in the report. And personally, I see really no contradiction. The sustainable economy, that is with social cohesion, it's economic cohesion, it's environmental cohesion, it's on, on many different parameters. Uh, but I still think that green economy, then we know what we are talking about, that is a, as a sort of contradiction to, to continuing a fossil fuel-based uh, economy, a, a black economy, if you will. So we, we have both, and we also have both mentioning of the green economy, because we basically think that that is also what sort of uh, to, to rather big segments globally show that we need a, a, a transformation of the way we create the growth and, and, and in the whole sort of energy chain. So um, I, I still believe that that should not be deemed out. Um, my feeling is also, now you're mentioning from Porto Alegre, but my feeling is also that more and more countries have sort of got sort of a, a bit more relaxed about this green economy where there were a bit more resistance uh, only six or maybe 12 months ago on this. So, so we should not shy too much away for also using the, the green economy that also some big economies now are using as a driver for a very, very big transformation in the way they create the growth. Well, um, uh, I would just like to, to say a few words on the, on the governance issue. If we have, um, uh, if we agree in Rio, and I hope we will, on um, uh, sustainable development goals, or at least on a process to get to them, and on um, uh, goals in any case for all um, uh, the people who will be in Rio, because Rio will not only be an intergovernmental meeting, it's going to be the, a sort of a rendezvous of, of lots of lots of people, and we want that. We, I mean, the Brazilian government is expecting 50,000 people to gather, and we're going to have four days before the summit in which um, we're going to discuss and, and, and probably take decisions. Um, you know, civil society, NGOs, scientists, business, um, local governments, local governments, very important. Lots of mayors will be there and try to also have their own agenda. 
So we're going to build what is called, you know, in the United Nations language, some sort of multi-stakeholder coalitions or something like that. Partnerships. But, you know, partnerships now, they have to be solid. And so there is some, a new word which is going to be very, very important. I think in Rio, we, we have to invent a new system of accountability. Accountability for everyone. Accountability for NGOs. Accountability for all the, the pledges uh, and all the commitments which we're going to hear. We're going to note them and we're going to say, okay, guy, this is what you said. Now let's look. And for the states, we're going to have this Sustainable Development Council, which is proposed. The idea of transforming the so-called commission, actually, which is not working so well, into a, into a, a, a council, when the governments, not only the governments, but also civil society will be there. And we'll see where are we on the road to the goals. Have we achieved something? So Rio plus 20 is going to be so important in 21, 22, 23, 24, because each year we're going to meet and say, this is what we have done. And so this is what's, in my view, so important. And beside that, we have the environmental pillar. Because, you know, in the United System, you have an agency for lots of things, but not for the environment. And so the environment is, is in a difficult position because it cannot take any decisions. It has to refer to the General Assembly. So each time you have a big problem in the environment, you create a new track. You have this climate, you have the biodiversity. So each time you have a big environmental problem, actually you weaken UNEP <laughs> because you, can, you cannot use UNEP, so you have to create something else. So in the end, it becomes silly because the environment is, get, is becoming so important. Why weaken UNEP all the time? Try to find a way you know, of getting it settled once forever and working. And so that's, that's, the, that's the problem I, I, I see. But for the rest, um, uh, sustainable uh, development, uh, green economy, what's important is what we're going to do, more than the words by which we're going to call them. What are we going to do on our priorities? I mean, people want Rio Plus 20 to be action-oriented and not only word-oriented. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, Mr. Pastor, Mr. Lalonde. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Je vous laisse ma carte.